Hello, everyone. Today, I want to talk to you about Firehose and Substreams for the Antelope blockchain ecosystem. First off, just to introduce Pinax as a team, we're a Web3 service provider. We're specialized in blockchain indexing operations. We're building analytics tools. And we have three years experience running Diffuse on all the different blockchains uh, in the Antelope ecosystem. We're also more recently an indexer with the graph, and we'd love to participate in lots of different Web3 activities. We run our own bare metal infrastructure. We host servers in multiple data centers in multiple locations. Our team is self-funded. We have seven co-founders and we're in Canada with a growing, ever growing, it seems like team of 50 team members. So today we want to talk about how do we get here? What is Firehose? Why is it needed? What's the architecture? Go into details about substreams, which are built on top of Firehose. And then from developers and applications, decentralized applications specifically, you know, how did how can you make use of this technology? So first off, let's talk about the existing Antelope ecosystem. Currently, there's multiple history solutions, but uh, they're usable. People use them all the time, but they're not quite perfect. So I'm not going to go through the details of all of the different solutions. We talked quite a lot about that in the API Plus blue paper that was done about a year ago. But let's talk about Diffuse a little bit because uh, we're the operators on Diffuse. So Diffuse is, uh, well, quite frankly, expensive. It's one monolithic, basically one monolithic application. I mean, you could turn off the block explorer if you didn't want it, but basically it's one monolithic application and you need to store all the data for all the chain from the genesis. So, you know, the Antelope ecosystem has blockchains that have a lot of transactions. So this gets quite large to manage all of that history. There are some things that you can filter out, but in general, it's not that flexible. So that's a big problem with Diffuse. But meanwhile, the technology that started in Diffuse is now turned into a powerful new standard that's being adopted very quickly across the Web3 community. And it's called Firehose and Substreams. So let's get into it. The Firehose and Substreams tech was built by the Diffuse team. So back in the Genesis days of the EOS ecosystem, they were called EOS Canada. They rebranded themselves to Diffuse. They rebranded themselves to Streaming Fast. But it's the same team, and they're building the technology behind Firehose and Substreams has this long, rich history in the Antelope ecosystem. Quickly, at the very high level, what is Firehose? So it's one data model framework for all the blockchains. All the blockchains, if you have a, a distributed ledger technology that has the concept of blocks and transactions, Firehose will work for it. So it's one way of representing all the data as a protobuf. Now, each blockchain has different way, different attributes that belong in a block or a transaction. So there are variances, but it fundamentally aligns to one structure. Uh, Firehose can run on a single server or it can run on a large cluster or anywhere in between. So it's very scalable depending on the requirements that you have. When you set up a Firehose infrastructure, it extracts all the blockchain data into flat files. This makes it very scalable compared to, say, running multiple blockchain nodes, each of which has to keep in sync with the network. Here you can run a very small number of blockchain nodes export all the data into flat files, and then manipulate them as you see fit, depending on what you're doing later. All the technology that we're talking about here is all open source and freely available to use. So why do we need Firehose in Web3? Let's just do a little imagining here for a couple of seconds. Imagine this ocean that we see in front of us is all the blockchain data in Ethereum. So we can imagine that this ocean keeps expanding 
because, well, Ethereum or like any other blockchain keeps moving forward, keeps adding more data to it. So what we need is we need a way to organize this data, what you need, how you need it, when you need it. Also, well, that was Ethereum, but now there's how many blockchains? I don't know. The world keeps expanding and, you know, Ethereum, EOS, Wax, Near, Solana, the volume of blockchains is ever increasing in terms of the content within a blockchain and the actual number of blockchains. And in the future, the world is multi-chain. Your, your, your future applications that you're going to be interacting with as a user is not one blockchain. You're going to have to interact with multiple blockchains depending on which application is on which blockchain. So we talk about firehose and substreams like it's a super powerful straw that allows you to suck up the information from an individual blockchain and organize it the way you want it. Firehose takes care of managing hard forks and upgrades behind the scenes. Well, the operator of the Firehose infrastructure has to deal with all that. But you as a user, the application developer or an app, don't have to worry about that stuff. It, it abstracts the different blockchains that work in different ways. Doesn't matter how they work. Firehose all works the same way. It doesn't matter which blockchain. Different blockchains have different APIs. They have different clients. They have different infrastructure, whatever. It doesn't matter. Firehose looks the same no matter which blockchain. The actual details, of course, vary depending on the content of the blocks, but the way it works is the same. So Firehose and Substreams offers more flexibility for operators. It's more affordable. Since it's more affordable, that means it's more reliable because, for example, with their existing Diffuse solution, maybe we don't want to put that in too many data centers because, well, that costs a lot of money to make it reliable across multiple data centers. But with Firehose, much easier because we can scale it up or down depending on the requirements. So that's a great thing. The other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a standard. So all of these chains today, you can use Firehose. EOS, Telos, Wax are all part of the same Web3 ecosystem in terms of support for Firehose. Let's talk quickly about the Firehose architecture. So this is a very simplified view of the world, but let's start on the right side. The Firehose enabled execution node. In the Antelope ecosystem, this is your normal blockchain node. So it's called Leap. Leap has all of what it needs in order to be enabled for Firehose, which is great. There's no extra infrastructure that needs to be run by an infrastructure operator. It's all available out of the box. So that's not the case in all the other ecosystems. In Ethereum or Near, that's not part of the standard blockchain node. These have to be added after the fact. And that's an extra maintenance thing. So this is a big advantage we have in the Antelope ecosystem that Firehose instrumentation is embedded right within Leap. So once we have that execution node, it will talk to Firehose ecosystem. And I'll expand on this in the next slide, what that Firehose box looks like. All the data is stored in an object store. Object store here means your local file system. It could be an S3 bucket, Google Cloud Store, NFS, wherever you want to put those files. They're just flat files after all. Nothing special about them. You can store them wherever you want. So we'll just call it the object store. Okay, so for the last box on the top left, the graph node, we put graph node on the slide here to represent actually anywhere Firehose can use, data can be used. So in this case, we put graph node. So that's the graph ecosystem. We can take Firehose data and put it into graph. You can also put it into an SQL database, or you could put it into you know, a key value store or wherever. So Firehose is just a pipe of data that allows you to then do something with it, whatever it is up to you. We also have the user box here. So the user can connect to Firehose directly and interact with it. It's not the really meant for users, but you can. It's really meant more for users to interact with, say, GraphNode, and GraphNode is getting data from Firehose. Okay, let's go into that Firehose box in a little bit more detail. 
So we've got the same fire hose enabled execution node up there at the top right. It connects to the reader. The reader component is responsible for reading all the blocks as they occur in the blockchain. So new block happens, the reader notices, and then it will pass it to the relayer. And then the relayer will pass it to the Firehose gRPC, which is the thing that users can connect to or we can connect to the graph node. So this happens in real time. As blocks are recognized in the environment, they are passed in real time to the user. Do, 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 do. So the reason that there's a relayer component there is because maybe we'll have multiple readers, multiple relayers in a high availability solution. So I just simplified the diagram to just show one, but you may have multiple depending on your organization. So the reader also writes all the files, all the blocks into files in the object store. So every time there's a new block, a new file gets written in the object store. So for example, if a fire hose needs blocks from three weeks ago, they're all stored in the object store. When it connects, it can get all of the previous blocks. And then once it gets up to live, then it connects to the relayer and it gets things live. So this happens transparently. The user doesn't need to worry about it. The, we have a couple of components at the bottom. The search indexer, which is not actually used today in the Antelope ecosystem, it's used in Ethereum, allows a Firehose user to skip over blocks that are may not have the transactions that they're looking for. We may implement that for Antelope in the future. And the merger takes all those individual blocks and chunks them up into 100 block chunks. And we'll see that on the next slide. So here we are. This is what a directory looks like that might be sitting on your local hard disk. You can see that there's files starting with 0000, whatever, and they go up by 100. So each file contains up to 100 blocks in the blockchain. Very easy. You can copy them around, do whatever you want with them. Okay, so that was a review of Firehose. Now let's talk about substreams. So Firehose gives you the whole block. When you connect to Firehose and you say, give me block 1000, you get the entire block 1000. For an application that might be running in your web browser, you don't want the whole block. That's way too much information and will slow down your, your application. So Substreams allows a developer to provide information about exactly what they want. Developers can provide that information in such a way that it's composable. So composable means that if I build a substream, for example, that can send all ESIO tokens, the transactions. So every time there's a transaction on the blockchain in Antelope, it would match. But my application doesn't need all of them. It just needs a subset. So I'm working on farmer's world. I just want the farmer world transactions. Great. You can build a substream on top of my substream that just gets yours. So that's a great way. You don't have to understand the details of the, the lower level substream. You can just build as a developer on top of it. The substreams are also parameterizable. So this is the idea that at runtime, say the user using an application, say Upland, they just want to see their related Upland transactions, right? So they could just pass their account name in and they just get that. So, so they're composable and parameterizable. They're also transformable. So a substream can be written in a way that allows it to be, say, inserted into a database or... Maybe it runs live in a web browser, or maybe it stores in a key value store, or maybe it updates Prometheus from a monitoring perspective. So the, the output format where the data is stored is customizable. And so if you want to store in a database, you want an insert statement, insert, 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 for example, or update. But if you're storing it somewhere else, you want it to, to look different. So the substream can target the, the platform where it's going and output the right instructions. Substreams are also parallel, parallelizable in such a way that 
if a developer wants the history of the entire blockchain, well, if you just process one block at, block at a time, that will take a long time. What we want is, hey, I need 300 million blocks worth of data process. Great. I have 100 machines that can process that. Great. I can get results in an hour. If I don't have 100 machines, well, if I only have two machines, well, then I'll, it'll take longer. But the idea is developer doesn't have to worry about the parallelization. The service provider does that. And the output comes in the order of the blocks actually occurred, not in which it executes in the background. So a little bit technical, but suffice to say, it's fast. So substreams are generally available since March this year. And so ready to be used in all sorts of applications. So let's just look at the substreams architecture detail. This diagram looks uh, pretty much like the one I showed a few minutes ago, except there's an extra substreams tier two box here. So the substreams tier two box is the one that you would run as a service provider. You would run multiple of those substream tier twos that allows that parallel processing to happen. So firehose and substreams pipeline. So in data science, we talk a lot about extract, transform, load, and query, or ETLQ. So let's just talk about firehose and substreams in this context. So firehose is the extract. So it's taking all the data out of the blockchain as it happens, and it creates these flat files. Once we have these flat files, then we can transform them using substreams into whatever output that we need. So we can say we want only a certain sub set of transactions and we want it to look like this. So that's what Substreams is doing. Then we need to load the data somewhere. So that's called a Substream sync. So a Substream sync in my previous example was graph node. It can be Postgres, it can be MongoDB, it can be CSV flat file. So depending on how you want to use the data, it can be transformed into whatever output you need. And then there's the query layer, which according to where you loaded the data, then you have opportunity to query it. So if you're using graph node, for example, then you have a nice GraphQL interface. So where do we want to store it? Well, basically the idea is anywhere. Here's just a quick example of substreams are composable. So if I built that one at the bottom that's in pink, then you could come along and build the yellow one. And then somebody else could come along and build, you know, one of the light blue ones or a purple one on top of it. So there will be a registry where all of these substreams will be published. Uh, that doesn't exist yet. It's in process of being developed. And so you'll be able to find existing substreams that are available then use the ones that you want, build on top of it. Maybe there's already one for what exactly you want to do, so then you don't have to write anything. This library of composable substreams is going to come very soon. Let's look at the developer workflow. So first off, we want to write the substream. So in order to write a substream, you need to learn a little bit of Rust. So Rust is a programming language. It's a little bit of a barrier to get into it, to start learning Rust. But you don't have to learn all of Rust. You need to learn a little bit of Rust according to what you need to write code for. So using existing substreams as examples will be will help a lot here. But yeah, you do need to learn a bit of Rust in order to write a substream. Substreams are then compiled to Wasm. Wasm is WebAssembly, which is the same thing that runs in your web browser to you know, run interactive applications on the web. You write code in Rust, the code is compiled to Wasm, and then you send that Wasm to Firehose. Dear Firehose, here's my Wasm, please run it for me. And Firehose will take that code and run it on the server. And if you've got multiple tier two nodes in your environment, then it will run it in parallel and get you the results very quickly. So the results will come back in order of the blocks. And then once you've got the results, then do something with it. It's up to you. You can run Firehose in your web browser. You can run it on a server. Do whatever you want with it. So substreams are fast. 
So we have examples of where things go from, you know, two months to one week. Actually, even more recently, I, I heard an example of something taking two months changing into one day. <clears throat> so we are Substreams enables developers to build things a lot faster than previously. So Vincent from Mazari, you know, po posted a tweet like six months ago. Hey, managed to process the entire history of Ethereum in 20 minutes. So that's pretty cool. Let's talk about what it means for decentralized applications. As a DAP developer, you know, use existing substreams or build your own. Stream data directly to a website, generate Telegram alerts, Discord alerts, create a dashboard. There's a lot of different things that you can do with substreams. Those are some simple use cases. Don't take a lot of work. Or more complicated things, you know, store it in a database and build on top of it like you would a Web2 application. So once you have data in a database, then you can build whatever you want. Here's just a couple of examples of things that are using substreams today. So our team is working on a Google Sheets plugin. So you can imagine, hey, I will need to build my tax report at the end of the year. I need to see all my transactions. Well, you can run a substream right inside Google Sheets and populate your accounting data. Sounds pretty cool. You know, this example of a Pomelo watchbot. Hey, what's going on with Pomelo? We can see the, you know, we can look at the transactions that are happening on chain and push them over to Telegram. More complicated example, Geo Web Browser, which is a Web3 browser looking at what's happening on blockchains. It's all going to be powered by substreams. In the future, imagine whatever you might want to do. GameFi, digital identity, social media, real estate, virtual reality. All these things can use substreams. So what it means for developers, there's a few different things to think about. From smart contracts, we can stop doing weird things to manage on-chain data. This applies more in the Ethereum ecosystem than in the Antelope ecosystem. But sometimes you have to store data in the blockchain in a certain way in order to be, to be able to read it later. And now that we've got a proper query engine in Firehose and Substreams, that makes a smart contract development a little easier. We also have, for the data analysis set of developers, you can take all this data and throw it in a data warehouse. That will work really, really well. And then you can do AI, machine learning type of applications based on all your Firehose data. So really, the future is open. What do you want to do with Firehose and Substreams? So as I mentioned before, you do need to learn a little bit of Rust. But once you have your data feed, then you can use whatever language you want to process it. So we have examples today in TypeScript slash JavaScript, Golang, Python, etc. This is a quick example of the GUI that you would see as you're developing a substream on the console. So th there's been a lot of work going on in this in order to allow developers to quickly iterate through their development. So what we're seeing here, for example, it's loading blocks in live. Uh, you can navigate between the blocks by using the O and P keys. And then you can see the output of the, the substream at a specific block. If you run into, oh, whoops, that's not what I wanted. You can hit the edit, change your, your substream, hit rerun, and it will run it through again. And so, and even the GUI will stay on the same page where you left off and then show you the updated result. So there's a lot of work going into the Substream's development experience for developers to make it really easy to iterate through changes and see the results coming back in your... So no more write something, wait two months, oh, it didn't work, right? You want to be able to very quickly make changes. Shorter development cycles, faster to market, build more cool stuff. That's the idea here. So. Firehose quick summary then, we're going to decouple the reads from the writes. So the blockchains are great at writing data, not so good at reading it. Firehose is great at reading data. Obviously it doesn't handle the writes, no need to. 
There's one data model for all the blockchains, avoiding inconsistencies, different design patterns, whatever. They all work the same way. You get a Firehose gRPC connection, or if you're writing substreams, then you get a substream uh, WASM interface written in Rust. Data completeness, all the data is extracted into flat files. State changes, database operations, gas fees, you know, whatever it is that you need is there. So no more doing JSON RPC calls to get block or get transaction. Parallel processing on the server side. So if the service provider running the Firehose infrastructure has hundreds of servers or, you know, they're in the cloud and they have that set to auto scale, then the processing on substreams goes very, very fast. So this is going to power the next generation of blockchain data APIs. The, the future is open to many different possibilities. And of course, everything is open source. We will be working on compatibility for EOS EVM. So today, EOS EVM, you can use all the data stored in EOS. So you can use the existing EOS Firehose. In the future, there might be a Firehose that's specific to EOS EVM that looks more like an Ethereum block. So you could compare an EOS EVM block to a regular Ethereum block and they would look the same. The, the speed of EOS, you know, Firehose came out of the Antelope ecosystem. It was developed with the speed and requirements of storing huge amount of data in mind. So it's absolutely tailored to work with the envelope chains. All right, for more information, I've recorded a few videos earlier, which are available on our YouTube channel for how to operate the overall architecture, running Firehose, how to set it all up. There's also a GitHub repository called Awesome Substreams. We're collecting all of the links there. If you know about more different awesome substreams things, feel free to add more things into that repo. And as I mentioned, there will be a substream registry coming. It's just in the planning phases at the moment. If you have more questions, feel free to follow us on social media. Send us some questions on Twitter. Happy to answer anything that you have. Also, you can write comments below in the YouTube channel. Thanks.